Today, uh, we're going to try to get through a lot. Uh, it's just me. <laughs> no uh, surprise visitors, so surprise guests that I'm going to hijack from other areas today. So we're going to talk about a line of cases involving collective bargaining and the intersection of antitrust law and labor law. Uh, we, st we did the line of cases last week in baseball that really took us through the antitrust exemption all the way past the Kurt Flood case. They really talked about how the theme of this class sometimes is just you see sports and things happen differently than other areas of law. It's really true with some of the cases we dealt with last week especially because the Flood case obviously recognized the inequality of baseball to other sports, recognized the inequality of the reserve clause, it recognized the almost stupidity of having one sport with an antitrust exemption, but it allowed it. And it allowed it because of those, that P word precedent set by the United States Supreme Court in 1922 with federal baseball. Um, as I said, as we remarked about the Kurt Flood case, it had an incredible uh, language to it where you have Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman quoting uh, Casey at the bat. We had uh, Justice Blackman listing, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 Hall of Fame type players, Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, Enos Wagner, Lou Gehrig, all that. Uh, an extraordinary opinion that to me had very little to do with the law and very lot to do with the love of baseball. And it's something we see all the time. Uh, it's something we see because I continue to say that we're humans first, we're lawyers second, we're humans first, we're judges second, and we're sports fans first, <laughs> and lawyers and judges second and third. It just seems like that's what we come across a lot of times, even at the highest levels, which is really funny. Uh, when you start thinking about it. Almost the more uh, elevated the judge's level, the more it seems like they're just fans to begin with. Sometimes you find it differently. You find it works differently, a different uh, district court versus appeals court. Uh, to bring back another current event where we've kind of left alone for a few weeks, Ezekiel Elliott, uh, again, he went through it in the Texas courts, the lower court, letting him play, the Fifth Circuit saying, no, you can't play. So Texas part is over for Elliott, but he's now taken this to New York courts. Um, the NFL filed in New York to confirm the suspension, okay? So get a judicial confirmation of their six game suspension of Ezekiel Elliott by doing so, they ensured themselves, at least according to them, a friendly jurisdiction because they won in the Tom Brady case. They want to stay in New York or at least the Second Circuit. And now on Monday, it goes in front of the New York judge who will decide whether Elliott plays under suspension, excuse me, whether Elliott suspension is back on or is off while the case goes forward to a bigger case which will probably be heard sometime in 2018. My prediction all along has been that Ezekiel Elliott plays in 2017 and is reversed in 2018 by a court of appeals, which now it would be the Second Circuit, which would be an exact replica of the Tom Brady case. Uh, it just seems to be going down that path. I would not be surprised if the judge in New York on the lower court judge in New York uh, stays the suspension, means puts back the suspension. Uh, but I think we've seen lower courts tend to side with the player, higher courts tend to side with the league. Uh, that's probably the projection we'll see. We'll know on Monday this long running saga that's taken all semester with Ezekiel Elliott, who's continued to play, as you know, uh, throughout this quote unquote suspension that's not there. Here's what happens, for good, for bad, for better or worse. Here's what happens with the Tom Brady case, with the Ray Rice case, with the Adrian Peterson case, with the Ezekiel Elliott cases. 
we, maybe you, but generally people are not talking about domestic violence, deflated footballs, hitting a woman, hitting a child. No one's talking about that. What we're talking about is collective bargaining issues and legal issues. And can he play, right? So it really does obscure what these cases are all about. And we can have our own views on deflated footballs. I think everybody has mixed views on that. But I don't think there's anybody that's like pro-domestic violence. Right? There's no one that says, OK, that's cool. Right? No one. Zero. Yet, when you talk about whether Elliot should be suspended or not, you get totally mixed opinions. And this goes back to the essence of this course, is what is the role of sports law? What is the role of governance and legal precedent in sports? Because we all agree domestic violence is bad. Now, how do we deal with it? And the general tone about the NFL, maybe opposed to the NBA or NHL or baseball, is that they, meaning Commissioner Goodell, has been overreaching, has been overofficious has gone beyond the line, has jumped the shark. That's been the general opinion. Now, again, before we get to the cases, here is the bringing it back to the current events. What the president has tried to do with Goodell is shame him even to be even more overreaching than he has been when he's already been the most overreaching commissioner in the history of sports when it comes to player conduct. Yet, according to the president, he has not done enough because players continue to protest what is seen as an anthem protest, which is seen as against the military, which is seen as against the flag, which is seen as against police, which is seen as against the country. That's another debate whether it is or not. But here's the thing. The NFL owners have brought in players to talk about this. And they have not changed the rule. As we know, the rule does not require standing for the anthem. So they're talking about it. This, to me, is the most progressive NFL we have seen in Roger Goodell's commissionership, right? If we talk about Goodell, who's overreaching, who suspends these players for no reason, who gave Ben Roethlisberger six games, gave Ezekiel Elliott six games, gave Tom Brady four games, we would have expected that when players are kneeling or locking arms or whatever, he would just make a rule and say, you got to do more than that. You got to stand at attention, put your hand over your heart. But you know what he does? He brings them in to a meeting to sit down as human beings. <laughs> and we talked about this a little last week as equals. You don't have to stand. We'd like it if you stood. You don't have to. And that's where we are. And they're talking. And what are they talking about? They're talking about the issues the players are complaining about, about mass incarceration, about inequality of law enforcement, about social issues, about inequality of justice for blacks in, in, uh, in sentencing. And then you have players, obviously, if, you've, if you're here in Philly, you've seen the stories about Chris Long and Malcolm Jenkins going to Harrisonburg, Harrisburg. Harrisburg or Harrisonburg? Harrisburg. There's a Harrisonburg. Virginia, OK. This one is Harrisburg, OK. Harrisburg. Um, Harrisburg to, to, to lobby. And I think what happens is you realize these players have a voice. And I saw some state senators or state congressmen like tweeting out, look, I got to meet with Malcolm Jenkins today. Like, it was cool for them. And then you realize this is the power that they have. Um, and it's working. So the Colin Kaepernick thing continues to resonate. 
Uh, I don't know if any of you are jumping in these meetings we're having around school this week or came last week when I spoke. It's just something that continues to resonate, the whole take a knee idea. I think it's something where uh, the NFL has probably been as progressive as you would think they could be. No rules, everything's policy. Their policy was encouraged, not required to, take, to stand. Their policy was should stand, not must stand. They haven't changed the policy. There have been some cryptic remarks by a couple owners, the Cowboys' Jerry Jones, about some discipline. If they don't stand, well, the Cowboys did have a player, David Irving, who raised his fist. To this point, we have not seen any discipline of Irving, uh, despite what Jerry Jones said, so we'll see. And again, my point again, having worked for a team to give you that insight, the thing that we always had to worry about was balancing all the interests, fan sponsors, suite holders, politicians, local politicians, state politicians, some of whom got us funding for stadium construction. And then, of course, your most important constituency is the players. So how do you balance all those needs? I mean, all these teams are hearing from people that it's bad for business to have these images of players not standing at attention for the anthem, but players have real concerns. And this is the forum. So the negotiation that's happened, as I talked about, is players saying we want to be heard, owners saying you can be heard, but let's do it this way. Let's put it on our website. Let's, we'll give money. We'll, we'll set up meetings for you on Capitol Hill. We'll have a boot camp in February about these issues, a boot camp, which seems to resonate. So that's the negotiation. On the player's side, all they're asking for from the players is don't do it on game day. If I'm a player, though, I like, well, that's when everyone's watching, right? If we don't do it on game day, who's going to know? So you see, and again, the theme of this class is putting yourself in position as lawyers, as counsel, to a commissioner, to a player's union, to say, what do we do? This is not in any law school textbook how to deal with an anthem protest, how to deal with a social activism protest. It will be. You know, there'll be a chapter on Kaepernick at some point in these books, but how to deal with it. And I'm very critical of the NFL, as you know sometimes. I think they've done a good job here. They've been solicitous of the players. They haven't made any hard and fast rules. It seems to be going okay. And lo and behold, we have news today that they're going to meet again Tuesday. And who might be there? Colin Kaepernick. At the meeting. While he's suing them. <laughs> which will be an interesting side, side note. Um, so we'll follow that. Okay? Um, the one thing I want to talk about when we talk about sports unions, we've mentioned when we talked about collusion cases, we talked about um, the uh, Messer Smith McNally decision, we talked about the beginnings of unions and the baseball union, which is widely seen as the strongest players union in sports, Major League Baseball's Players Association, MLBPA, started by Marvin Miller, who was a union leader from other, other walks of life. Uh, normal civilians, not just athletes. So when we talk about unions in sports, I want you to consider how unique that is. Because unions are the, the other half of the equation of the paradigm of management and labor. Labor means unions. And unions in sports are so different. You just have to know that. Because in a union, a pick a, pick a field, electricians, plumbers, shipbuilders, dock workers, whatever it is. Generally, not exactly, but generally you have people making similar amounts of wages, doing similar types of jobs, and but for seniority, make similar amounts of compensation. Wages, hours are pretty much the same. 
terms of employment. Okay? That's a normal union. Here's the problem for sports. You have superstars and you have rank and file in the same union. And they have vastly different priorities. Okay? So in the same union, you have Aaron Rodgers, Cam Newton, Tom Brady, along with 500 players making minimum salary. In the same union, you have LeBron James and James Harden and Kevin Durant, along with 200 players making minimum salary. These are the challenges with sports unions. There are no unions for superstars, and there are no unions for just the rank and file players. They're all in one. So if you're a lawyer for a union, if you're a lawyer against a union, you've got to know this. And especially if I mention you're a lawyer against the union, you can leverage this. You can play this to a strength where you may want to offer something for the rank and file that the, that the uh, superstars don't care about or vice versa. If you're a superstar, if you're a star player, you're concerned about free agency. You're concerned about whether I can make 20 million versus 25 million. You know, you're concerned about moving teams earlier in your career. You're concerned about rights of forming a super team or something like that. But if you're a rank and file player, as a former agent, these are the guys I dealt with. I didn't deal with superstars. And they're like, I just want to know, you know, do I have insurance? <laughs> What's my minimum salary? What's that? What is that? What's it going to be next year? And what's guaranteed? So when I was representing players on the fringe, their number one question to me was, how long will my insurance last? We're thinking of getting pregnant this year. Am I going to have insurance if I get cut? You know, those are the type of questions. Not so much. You know, what about free agency? Now, we're going to talk about free agency because that's, that's the issue. That's really players' rights. That's legal. But when we talk about most players, they're just concerned about, you know, what can I make in my five years? How much insurance do I have? What's my pension going to be? You need a certain amount of years to get a pension to vest. So these are the issues. And again, that, those are the concerns of normal workers in this country. We don't have a lot of superstars in, in normal unions. Uh, so again, I'm just talking about the anomaly of sports unions right now, because we're going to talk about it. When we talk about unions and collective bargaining, think about those negotiations. And a LeBron James is going to have a ton of different concerns than a bench player that's at the bargaining table. And some things you note about these collective bargaining agreements, the people who've negotiated NFL, NFL agreements, by and large, have been rank-and-file players, linemen, backup quarterbacks. The people who've negotiated NBA and Major League Baseball collective bargaining agreements have been stars. The president of the NBA PA is Chris Paul. The vice president is LeBron James. There's nothing like that in football. Eric Winston, he's a, he's a fringe offensive lineman, president of the NFL Players Association. You know, Mark Herzlick, who's from around here, linebacker with the Giants. Steve DeAssi, Jack DeAssi. I mean, these are backup players. Which is a whole nother discussion. Why don't superstar players like Rodgers or Brady or Newton or Wilson get involved with union? And why do they in basketball? You know, that's a whole nother discussion. We could have a lot of opinion on that. But my point is, the agreements are reflective of that. OK? 
okay? When we talk about some basketball players now making 200, 250 million dollars, well, okay, the guys who negotiated that agreement allowed for that, allowed for these super maximums now that James Harden can take advantage of. So this is something we don't have in football. We don't, and we have things like franchise tags in football, which restrict the best players. Why? Because the people negotiating the deals, they're never going to have to worry about franchise tags. They're average players. So I think the who negotiates, now we're not talking about the lawyers, they're always involved as well, but the who of the players makes a difference on what the eventual deal looks like. Okay, as we start talking about these union cases, uh, keep in mind what I said about Kurt Flood. We have these players that are willing to go to the bat as name litigants and sacrifice careers. Kurt Flood is the prime example of that. Here's another one. Tight end with the Baltimore at that time, Baltimore Colts, who John Mackey, who sacrificed his career uh, against the NFL as a litigant. And again, as I say that, I'm thinking of Colin Kaepernick. Did he sacrifice his career now suing the NFL? That remains to be seen, but we'll see. Who's talking about Mackey? Tell me your name again. Will. White, Will. Okay. So, all right, so, um, group of players sued the NFL, essentially alleging that the Roselle rule uh, violated the Sherman Act. So, under the Roselle rule, uh, when a player's contract expired, uh, the player signed with a different team as a free agent, and the new team had to compensate the player's family. Uh, so, the district court found that the rule was actually a per se violation of the Sherman Act and enjoined its enforcement. So, on appeal, uh, there are two issues. The first was uh, whether the labor exemption to antitrust law uh, shielded the NFL's enforcement of the Roselle Rule. Um, and if not, whether the Roselle Rule itself um, violated the antitrust laws. Right. So, as to the first issue, um, the court asked whether the Roselle Rule qualified for labor exemption. So, uh, certain union activities are statutorily exempted uh, from antitrust laws. And the Supreme Court held that some union and employer agreements. Uh, had to be given non statutory exemptions from antitrust sanctions. So, in order to find that exemption, courts weigh essentially labor and antitrust interests against each other uh, by asking three questions. So, first of all, uh, they look at you know, if the restraint on trade primarily affects only the parties, the collective bargaining relationship. So, in this case, the court found that, like, yeah, um, the result will affect only the parties to uh, the 68 and 70 collective bargaining agreements. Right. So next, the court looks at uh, whether the agreement concerns <coughs> a mandatory subject of collective bargaining. So that would be you know, wages, hours, terms and conditions of employment. Um, so in this instance, the Roselle rule essentially restricted the player's ability to uh, move team to team and also depress their salary. So it was a uh, mandatory bargaining subject. And then third, uh, the court asks whether the agreement is a uh, bona fide arm's length bargaining. Um, so in this case, the court found that there wasn't any arm's length bargaining. Right. Um, so when the rule was implemented in 1963, uh, the Players Association was relatively weak. Right. Uh, you know, it was newly formed and inadequately financed, so you know, really couldn't take on the teams. Uh, so therefore, the Roselle rule didn't qualify for a labor exemption. Uh, it wasn't protected from antitrust laws. So the court then turned uh, to whether the Roselle rule violated the Sherman Act. Uh, so, as a preliminary matter, the court found uh, it was inappropriate to declare the rule uh, as per se illegal. Instead, it should have been tested under uh, the rule of reason. Right? So, that rule of reason essentially states that the Sherman Act applies only to um, agreements that unreasonably restrain trade. So, you focus on if there's a legitimate business purpose and if the rule is no more restrictive than necessary. Uh, so, essentially, the NFL argued that. Um, will provide a competitive balance in the league. Um, also, you know, protecting the team's investment in player development costs. Uh, also, improve the quality of play, really. Um, district court shot down each of those arguments. Um, and appellate court agreed and said that, you know, removing the Roselle rule wouldn't really disrupt professional football and wasn't essential in maintaining a competitive balance in the league. Um, but, I mean, even if there were legitimate business purposes, uh, the rule is still overly restrictive in itself. 
um, you know, because it applies to all players regardless of their talent. Uh, it's, you know, unlimited in duration. It has no real procedural safeguards uh, for the players. So uh, based on those reasons, the appellate court found uh, that it did uh, restrain trade in violation of the Sherman Act. Okay, very good. Uh, so this is a real intersection of antitrust and labor. And what Will indicated is, is the test, which we'll get to in the next slide. But first, you have to understand, if something called the non-statutory labor exemption is at play, we never get to antitrust. And we're going to see cases like that. This is one where we did get to antitrust because the non-statutory labor exemption was not met. The three-prong test will go over. The third prong wasn't met. Uh, so you get back to antitrust. As he said, the background is a new union, right? Just like we talked about with baseball, new union, no leverage. What they were able to get in, though, was we've got a form of free agency. The Roselle rule, Roselle was the commissioner at the time, Pete Roselle. And the Roselle rule in, in football was their form of free agency. That was the first form of free agency in sports. And what it basically said was, when your contract's up, you can go to another team. Just like that, free agent. But the other team has to give us something back. So player leaves team A, goes to team B, Team B has to give something back. What's the thing they give back? Well, they have to agree on it. Okay, they can never agree on it. So what if they can't agree on it? It goes to the commissioner. Pete Rozelle decides what Team B gives back to Team A for losing the player. Okay, the net effect, net, net, no free agency. No one ever moved, either because they couldn't agree on what to give back or they didn't want to leave it to the commissioner. Because if you leave it to the commissioner, then you, know, you don't know. Your team, just like we talked about with David Stern and Chris Paul, you don't want that coming from the commissioner's office. Even if he's truly independent, you don't want the commissioner deciding to the makeup of your team. So while it was great that the new CBA had a provision that somewhat resembled free agency, in this case the Roselle rule, no one ever moved. So what happened? Because there was no true free agency, the NFLPA sued the NFL in the name of their president, John Mackey, the picture there, tight end for the Baltimore Colts, president of the NFL Players Association. So Mackey v. NFL becomes the test case for free agency in its form back then called the Roselle Rule. Two parts to the, to the test. Is the Roselle Rule satisfy the labor exemption? We'll hit that second. First part, does it satisfy the antitrust exemption? Uh, not exemption, the antitrust test. And the reason antitrust we go to is because it didn't hit the, the three prongs of labor exemption. But for antitrust, we're looking at the balancing, like Will said, between what are the pro-competitive benefits of the rule and what are the anti-competitive restraints of the rule. That is called the rule of reason test in antitrust, and those of you who take antitrust know that. The other thing you should know is that there are per se violations of antitrust law. We're not dealing with that. Those are things like group boycotts, um, tying arrangements, where you pay this, I'll pay that, we agree. You know, again, antitrust law, which some of you probably know better than I do, is all about monopolies, it's all about fair competition, it's all about restricting um, competition, and antitrust law looks at whether they have forcibly restrained competition to the point of true restraints of trade. Players are bringing it up, saying we have no way to move teams. Roselle rule is effectively eliminated any form of free agency. Go to court. Under the antitrust equation, as Will said, you look at this balancing test, and this bullet, the second to last bullet here, where it says 
the restraint was not justified by a legitimate business purpose. Okay, was more restrictive than necessary. That's the balancing act. The business purpose that owners want is competitive balance, it always is. And that seems to be legitimate business purpose, but it was too restrictive. No one ever moved. So the judge is not in a position to tell the NFL what to do with free agency, but he is in a position to tell them that's not good enough. Okay, does everyone get that? We're not gonna see the judge impose a new form of free agency, that doesn't happen. But the judge says the one you have Roselle rule is not good enough. Because no one moved, and it, does, it doesn't, it, it can be a less restrictive alternative, whatever that is. And then after this, there was a new CBA, had a different method, method of free agency, still, still no one ever moved, but we'll get to that. Um, the reason this got to antitrust court, it didn't pass the non-statutory labor exemption case. To review what Will said, because these are bright line rules, we often don't get these in sports law, but this is a three-pronged test you use. It's called the Mackey test. You establish a non-statutory labor exemption. Non-statutory, you understand, there's no law, there's no statute. It's just through case law. Non-statutory labor exemption means that if you meet these three prongs, you never have to deal with an antitrust question. I've already indicated this throughout the semester that these collective bargaining agreements insulate management. They allow management to impose things they often wouldn't be able to in a real court of law because they already have an agreement. They have a private agreement. They don't have to go to court. Okay, what are those tests? Three prongs, one, is it a mandatory subject of bargaining? And as Will said, when you talk about free agency, what's that equal? That equals money. Money, compensation, wages. That is a mandatory subject of bargaining. So test number one, prong number one, yes. The Roselle rule is part of that. It is a mandatory subject of bargaining. Does it only affect the parties to the collective bargaining relationship? Who are the parties? Same paradigm, management, labor, owners, players, commissioner, players, union, these parties. Obviously, yes. Free agency, Roselle rule is all about teams and players, management, labor. <coughs> We're not dealing with officials. We're not dealing with popcorn vendors. We're dealing with players and owners. That's prong number two. The third prong was not satisfied, as Will said, because what you need to see in a collective bargaining relationship is a bona fide arm's length agreement that they agreed to the Roselle rule. This is always the hardest prong. This is always what courts look at. Did you guys negotiate this? And in this case, the Mackey judge says no, no. It was a unilateral negotiation where the NFL said, we want this in our CBA. The players accepted it somehow, some way, because they had no leverage. They got this in there. And the judge said, no, we're not going to give you that for the non-statutory labor exemption because it was negotiated unilaterally. No product of bona fide arm's length bargaining did not satisfy that test. So the Mackey, in a rare case, the NFL, PA, the union, the player side wins against the NFL on two, two sides, antitrust and labor. But what Mackey has done precedentially is set up this three-prong test that is going to be, what's the word, uh, expanded, co-opted, by management, by leagues and owners to get what they want. Because, spoiler alert, this definition of bona fide arm's length bargaining is gonna become looser and looser and looser. It still is to this day. 
Did you really negotiate that? Well, courts are going to be much looser on that. The Mackey case said no, they didn't negotiate that, no good. Mackey is more, the more benevolent judge towards the players because increasingly we're going to see if it's in the collective bargaining agreement, it's going to be assumed, assumed it was the product of arm's length bargaining. And if you think about that logically, theoretically, that probably makes some sense if you're a judge, right? If you see something in the collective bargaining agreement, you're going to think, oh, okay, that was negotiated. This case is a bit of an anomaly. The player side said, we didn't negotiate that. And the judge said, okay. <laughs> or maybe they had evidence. They never negotiated it. But usually that's not even good enough. Okay, so the Mackey is a win for both players on both antitrust and labor, but sets up the labor exemption that's going to be key for all the rest of these cases in terms of whether it's in there or not. So you see the, the progression again. We never get to antitrust. We did in Mackey. We're never going to get there if the labor exemption applies. You're stuck with a collective bargaining agreement, you deal with it. Okay? Any questions about that? About Mackey? Okay, very similar case to Mackey from the world of hockey. Hockey fans, we got a case for you. McCourt versus the LA Kings, owned by California Sports. Who's talking about that? Yes. So this is just the NHL iteration of the reserve clause cases. Um, McCourt was a player for the Red Wings, and when they signed a goalie from the Kings in the summer, the Kings I and mean, the Red Wings were required to give them fair compensation. Right. And when they couldn't agree on fair compensation, it went to an arbiter, um, an arbitrator, and oh. um, the arbitrator chose the Kings' offer, which was to send McCourt to the Kings. He refused to go and disagreed and brought it to court. Right. So the issue was whether or not the reserve system um, is granted a labor exemption, just like the previous case. And they applied the Mackey test here. Before we get to that, what is the difference between the Roselle rule and this rule? They're very similar, except for one big difference. The Roselle rule went to the commissioner versus went to the commissioner? Correct. See the first four words there, a neutral arbitrator. So no commissioner here. The NHL union got a little stronger agreement than the NFL, where the Roselle rule, exactly the Roselle rule, but here independent arbitrator rather than a commissioner. Sorry, go ahead. So they applied the Mackey test, and they pretty much agreed that the first two problems were met, and the dispute was over whether or not this was an arm's length agreement. Right. And the trial court stated that it was not an arm's length agreement because the league wouldn't budge on their stance. But ultimately, the Court of Appeals overturned, and they said um, nothing in labor law compels either party negotiating to yield on its initial bargaining position. Right. And what the trial court saw was a failure to negotiate was simply a failure to succeed as an intense bargaining. Okay. Good job. This McCourt case has stood the test of time better, actually, than the Mackey case. And what I just hinted at you is that they're not going to bail out a union anymore for agreeing to something they didn't want. Okay, so let's go back to the test. <clears throat> Mandatory subject of bargaining, same as Roselle rule. Free agency, money, compensation, wages, absolutely mandatory subject. Number two, only the parties. Yes, players and owners, free agency, absolutely. Third part, was it the product of arm's length bargaining? Same issues as Mackey. Exact same issues, different result. Why? Because, your name? Nico. Nico. Nico, right. As Nico said, court's like, it's in there. Okay, so what we have here is the Sixth Circuit holding that 
I don't, the judge saying in so many words, I don't care that you didn't negotiate it. I don't care you think it was one way. I don't care you think it was not a bilateral negotiation, rather a unilateral negotiation. I am not as benevolent as the Mackey judge. And this McCourt Sixth Circuit said, you are stuck with it. You, McCourt, because you are part of the NHLPA. And the NHLPA negotiated this, this whatever we want to call it, I think they called it an equalization rule. So instead of Roselle rule, it's called equalization rule. And like the Roselle rule, no one ever moved. This case, McCourt didn't want to move, whatever. Not a real form of free agency. But the court said, we're not bailing you out. So back to the third prong. I don't know if it matters. We just gave you the three prong test. I don't know if the third prong even matters because we're going to see more cases like this. If it's in the collective bargaining agreement, we're going to assume it was negotiated. As Nico said, they're basically assuming you got something for that. Okay, you gave in on the equalization rule, you got something. Maybe you got minimum salaries a little higher. Maybe you got a good pension. Maybe you got health insurance. Maybe you got a, you know, a free agency rule somewhere else. But courts are not going to examine the sports terms like creating a new free agency system. They're just going to say, all right, what's in there? You're stuck with it. And I don't know if they said this in the McCourt case, but courts are going to say to these players in future cases, you got a problem with this rule? Go to your union. Don't go to court, don't go to your league, go to your union. Which again, spinning it forward, is kind of exactly what they told Tom Brady. <laughs> exactly what they told Tom Brady. You got a problem with your suspension because commissioner can do what he wants? Go to your union. Don't come to us. And again, spinning it forward, I think that's what they're going to tell Ezekiel Elliott. You got a problem with the six games? Go to your union. They negotiated. They have said uh, commissioner can do what he wants with player conduct. Okay, this is the first. A hockey case against the LA Kings decided that I don't even care about your bargaining history. I don't want to see notes of what you gave in or what you didn't, or you didn't want this equalization rule. You got it. So I would call this, instead of the Mackey exemption, I would call this the McCourt inclusion. McCourt includes anything that's in the collective bargaining agreement is fair game, according to this case. And again, it's the second highest level of courts in the country, Sixth Circuit. So McCourt stands for the fact if you see something in that collective bargaining agreement and you bring it to court, we're not going to be very sympathetic at all because we're assuming it's all three prongs. We're assuming it's negotiation. You say it wasn't, well, it's in there. Okay, so. From a player point of view, you had some hope with the Mackey case. You're back down to earth with the McCourt case. If you negotiate a collective bargaining agreement and come to court, the court's going to say, get out of here. This never got to antitrust court. It's a labor case. You got a collective bargaining agreement. It says equalization rule. You got a problem with that? Complain to your union. Don't complain to us. Okay. And it took the NHL many years to get a viable free agent system when they finally had some leverage. But this wasn't it. Um, from years of, of concussive hits, and uh, we will talk in the next couple of weeks, certainly before the semester ends, about concussion, concussion lawsuits out there on the pro level, the amateur level, the NCAA level. But um, 
just that that was a nice little homage to um, to Mackey, who led the charge on behalf of players, not only as a current player when he did against Roselle Rule, but also as a former player after his career. Uh, and unfortunately, his life ended that way, living very, uh, very uh, with much, much assistance. Uh, his wife seems like such a saint there who had to endure that life herself for so many years. Um, but as it was said at the end of the piece, there is a program now in the collective bargaining agreement for former players where you can get the 88 benefit, 88 after John Mackey, it's called the 88 plan. And that is uh, a help with long-term institutional care. Um, there is a benefit through collective bargaining. So his lasting effect on football players has uh, a benefit there. Obviously, if you have institutional care for a long period of your life, you know, nothing can pay all, all the expenses for that, but that certainly helps. So that was, uh, that was John Mackey. We, we reviewed his case, and there was his, uh, a nice piece on him as he died a few years ago in the middle of collective bargaining, of course. You know, you saw everybody gathering that day for collective bargaining, and that's the day he died. Okay. Moving on, as I mentioned, we're going to go into cases that are now involving the labor exemption for rookies. Uh, and again, I said this first day of class, how weird is it that we have rookies, that we have a draft in sports? And I know it's not apples to apples, but think about any other walk of life, doctors, lawyers, engineers, where you go are the best at your level, the best in college, and you go to the worst the worst in the country. That's your reward for being the best. Uh, that's what happens with drafts. We do it in the name of, an, of competitive balance in sports. That's the whole goal, right? That's tanking, that's trust the process, that's being bad to get good. Um, we allow it in sports. It sounds preposterous for lawyers, for doctors, for anything, but we allow it in sports. And sometimes you have cases that challenge it. And here's one, the Wood versus NBA case. Who's got that? Your name? Christian. Christian, right. Um, OK, so this is another good example of a non-statutory labor exemption. Leon Wood was a college senior um, who had been drafted by the Sixers. Um, at the time, the NBA and Players Union limited maximum salary, uh, with draft rights, and the, had a ban on player corporations um, through a previously established um, so he sued the NBA and Players Union claiming a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, he argued that the draft and the agreement to cap salaries all restrained trade. Um, basically, one of his arguments was because he wasn't part of this collective bargaining agreement, he should, right. should be held to it. So they applied the, uh, the Mackey test. Um, they were certainly uh, mandatory subjects of bargaining. Um, the restraint of trade did affect the parties to the CBA. And bona fide uh, arms length bargaining that established it. So the Sherman Trust Act didn't apply. It was just standard labor law. And in this case, they had to show irreparable harm, which, which they did not. So this motion for preliminary injunction was denied. OK. So going back to our labor exemption, as Christian said, first two easily met. Those are always easily met when we talk about money. It's a mandatory subject of bargaining, uh, draft is also primarily affects players and owners, players and management, of course. And whether it was bona fide arm's length bargaining, just like the McCourt case, the Wood case said yes. Um, the obvious question that you should ask about Wood, about any rookie, is how are they subject to bargaining? Because at the time of the negotiation of the collective bargaining agreement, these rookies are in college or high school or junior high school. OK, so think about that. In the NFL right now, we have a 10-year collective bargaining agreement negotiated in 2011. So in 2011, think about a rookie that's going to be coming in in 2020, the last year of the CBA. So he'll be 18 in 2020, 
So in 2011, he was what? Nine, right? So these collective bargaining agreements are about a nine-year-old, right? They're about nine-year-olds. So put that person in Leon Wood's shoes. He's going to sue, saying, when that was negotiated, I was in ninth grade. I was nine years old. Why should I be subject to a collective bargaining agreement? And here, now Wood referenced a couple cases that I don't have up here. You don't need to know those. But Wood referenced cases in normal union situations, not sports, but applied now to sports, which basically said, when, when, when unions negotiate collective bargaining agreements, it is anticipated that future union members will be bound. Applying that to sports, it is anticipated that future rookies will be bound. Now, if you take it outside of sports, it doesn't seem that weird, right? If you're doing a union of shipbuilders, yeah, some shipbuilder that's nine years old now is going to be subject to the terms and conditions of that collective bargaining agreement when he joins the shipbuilders union. And that is true for sports. So Leon Wood is told by the court, you know, you're, you know in a normal situation, what we look at where you have a cap, where you have minimum salaries, where you can't be a corporation, all things that you think are totally unfair, God bless you. As Christian said, but you're subject to them. Why? You are a member of the union. Well, I wasn't a union member when they negotiated. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay? So take, it, take the NFL right now. These rookies, they make a lot of money at the top. Like a Carson Wentz is making $26 million over four years. But you know what they made before that CBA? Like Sam Bradford back in the day? They made like $70 million. Not $26 million, $70 million. Carson Wentz can say, hey, screw that. Well, first of all, no one's going to weep for $26 million about a person making that, but he's subject to the new rules, even though he wasn't part of them. OK, so borrowing from standard labor law, we now understand that rookies, just like entering members of another real union besides sports, are subject to terms and conditions of their union, even if they were long before uh, when it was negotiated, they were in high school or junior high or whatever. Leon Wood is subject to that. The court said exactly what I said about McCourt. The court said, you got a problem? Who do they go to if they got a problem? Union. Don't come to court. Don't go to your league. You got a problem? Go to your union. Get them to change that in the next round. And then you see the picture there. Leon Wood is now a current NBA referee. Which, to close the loop, has a union. And guess who helped negotiate the NBA referees agreement? Leon Wood, who was told by a court to fix his problem with his own union. Now he's a union uh, leader for the NBA referees union. And yes, I looked, at, I looked up last year in uh, the NBA finals, the Warriors and Cavs. Looked up and saw Leon Wood on the court. So now every time you see him rough, you can think about his court case where he lost. <laughs> um, 
there are a lot of rules relating to, they don't call them rookies in collective bargaining agreements. That's not the legal term. They call them entering players. So there are a lot of rules in these collective bargaining agreements about entering players, which are much different than veteran players. In other words, spoiler alert, rookies get screwed. Why? Because when you negotiate, usually it's older players negotiating and they're looking out for their group. And if there's a place that they can give in on, it's the entering players and get the most for the older players. So one area that all, it seems like collective bargaining agreements always screw are the rookies. It's the easiest way to go. If you're looking for ways that you can sort of grab the low hanging fruit in collective bargaining, sacrifice the young players. They'll get theirs when they're older. And that certainly has happened in all of these agreements. Now, again, at the top, no one's going to, right, no one's going to feel sorry for 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds making 15, 20 million dollars. But in the past, they've made even more, a lot more. Okay, the most recent case involving the draft involves Ohio State's Maurice Claret. Um, who was the first NFL player to really challenge this. And think about a player like this where, and Zeke Elliott is probably one, where you have this amazing rookie season and you're at your height of power in terms of uh, marketability, yet you can't go pro because of a rule that says you have to be three years removed from high school to go into the National Football League. That's the NFL rule. We can talk about other rules. Hockey and baseball have all these kinds of junior rules in high school. And of course, we all know the NBA is now a one and done rule. One year you have to play college. But the NFL has been three years. We'll talk about why and how in a minute. But here's someone who challenged it uh, based on having a great year and then also having academic issues and here was his opportunity to challenge long-standing NFL rule about draft. Who's talking about that? You are Natalie, Natalie right? So the case you read was the Second Circuit case. Right. Right. And they also said the Mackey test was the appropriate test, but they didn't need to apply it because it wasn't an antitrust case at the end of the day. Okay. Okay, so here's the rule which I didn't which I kind of referenced to enter the NFL draft a player has to be three years removed from high school, which can mean, and those of you who obviously know these terms, can mean redshirt sophomore. Doesn't have to mean junior. So three years removed from high school. So you either finish your junior season in college or your redshirt sophomore season in college, you can apply for entry in the NFL draft. Claret was expelled from Ohio State way before that um, and tried to enter. Now again, he's got the academic issues, uh, some criminal charges, all of that. But beyond that, he's got marketability as a potential top draft pick. So it's the perfect storm for someone to sue the NFL about this rule. <clears throat> The rule is in the CBA, was agreed to by the NFLPA 
former leader Gene Upshaw made a statement, actually. I remember reading it as to why he agreed to the rule. He said something like, can you imagine, you know, um, some 18-year-old, 19-year-old running into Ray Lewis? Like, how scary that would be? Which to me, I mean, Gene Upshaw is deceased, Ray, rest in peace, but that's not a reason to negotiate that rule. As we know, some 18-year-olds are much different than others. Some 20-year-olds are much different than others. You know, some people look like Leonard Fournette, who looks like he's 46 years old, and he's 20. Um, you know, it just happens where some people maybe are that uh, able to do that. And as I've written about and talked about, I feel especially for running backs because their, their shelf life is so short, uh, they're all washed out by 27, 28 years old. And I look at this kid Barkley at Penn State and I just feel for him because, you know, he's, these are his best years. Uh, I don't feel for him, I just think compensation wise, he's restricted. He's very restricted. Because a normal athlete like him, and if he was a basketball or baseball or hockey player, he'd be making millions of dollars for what he's doing right now because he'd have that ability to, to make that. You know, and, and at some point, whether it's Barkley or Elliott or Fournette or McCaffrey, some team like I was is going to say to them, well, I don't know, you know, you've got a lot of wear and tear. Running back such a hard position. I don't know if we're going to give you another contract. And usually for running backs, that's about age 26. So um, that's my little digression. And this is the perfect player to challenge it, Maurice Claret, or, you know, what, or it would have been Barkley last year, where it's not, it's not the same for that position as it is others. They just have a, lo a shorter shelf life than other positions. So anyway, Claret challenges it. He hires an agent, which means he's done with college football. Once you do that, your eligibility is gone. And he tries to enter the 2004 draft. And as Natalie said, he won. He won. Because the lower court, here we are again, the lower court agreed that this was not an arm's length negotiation. Even with what I said about the union saying they're scared about players running into Ray Lewis, <laughs> they didn't feel that this was negotiated between the union and the owners. So I was now in the NFL. I remember this. You know what happened? The lower court decides for Claret, and there is a hysteria around the National Football League teams. My office, oh my God. I had every coach and scout in my office that afternoon saying, oh my God, what do we do? And they were concerned because now we have to scout every player in the country. Sophomores, freshmen, high school, junior high school. Because the judge just said, there's no rule. The rule's against antitrust. And every team was going through this. I remember it. Like, Claret, oh my god, what are we going to do? Some team out there is now scouting sophomores and freshmen, and we don't have it on them, and they're going to beat us, and what are we going to do? Of course, we called the league, we got on the phone with the league lawyers, and they said exactly what they say with, with Brady and Ezekiel Elliott, and they said, oh, relax, chill, tell your scouts to relax, tell your coaches we're not scouting freshmen, we're not going there, because we're going to win. <laughs> because we're going to get to the second circuit, ironically where Brady was one, we're going to get to the second circuit and we're going to win. Why are we going to win? Because the union agreed to this. You sure? Yeah. I'll give it to the NFL lawyers. They're paid a lot of money, but they, they calm people down. We're going to win.
And what judge did they get on the Second Circuit? One of the three judges. Who was that? Anyone? Anyone know what judge was the opinion in this case? Natalie? Sonia Sotomayor <laughs> is a hero in the NFL. She is an absolute god in the NFL offices. She saved the draft. <laughs> she saved the draft, not the draft, but the draft eligibility rule three years out. She saved it. It was dead. The lower court ruled for Claret. Claret's like, I'm good. I'm going to be a first round pick which he would have been at that time. Went to the Second Circuit, just like the NFL lawyers told us, ruled for the NFL, saying this is a product of arm's length bargaining, even if it wasn't, right? We learned that from a court and Wood. Even if it wasn't, it's in the collective bargaining agreement. Second Circuit rules for the NFL, we're back to the three-year rule, everything's good. What about Claret? Well, he had to sit out. He got fat. He went from first round to last pick in the third round, hardly ever played. We, another kid, Mike Williams, same position. He actually did get drafted high the next year. But this was a moment in time in football where everyone was like, oh my God, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to be like baseball. And at that time, basketball, I think, was high school. So, Sonia Sotomayor saved the three-year rule. Yeah, with Claret, I just try, like, I, like with Mackey, like with Kurt Flood, just kind of show you a little bit of the human side of uh, some of these what I call sports law pioneers, um, what their lives are like after they went through this hardship of suing their sports leagues. Unfortunately, you see some downward spirals, unfortunately, with Mackey and his mental health, and, and Claret, although he seems to be coming out of it. I remember being with the Packers, getting calls from his agent year after year, just begging for a job, begging for a practice squad job. And I'm thinking, this was the guy who was like going to be number one pick overall, sued the NFL, and then lost, and then that downward spiral. Uh, so you see how quickly things can change. And here's a guy that was challenging the NFL draft rule and actually won. <laughs> and Sonia Sotomayor of the now Supreme Court changed all that. Speaking of the Supreme Court, as we had the, uh, the presentation last couple weeks ago from the Dwayne Morris attorneys and the gambling expert, um, this is really gaining a lot of steam. Uh, PASPA, which is the rule against sports betting, the, the law against sports betting is now going to be challenged in court, Supreme Court, December 4th. We have a date. Um, I'm actually, because I've been talking about this, going to be on a bunch of panels. We're at, we actually have a media briefing now on December 1st at the National Press Club in D.C. I'll be on a panel with Ted Olson, who's going to be arguing the case on behalf of Chris Christie in New Jersey. Um, so it's gaining so much steam that last night was a 20-minute piece on HBO's Real Sports about what's ahead and the hypocrisy of gambling, uh, where sports leagues are now going to Las Vegas, even though they're fighting gambling. So I hope you enjoyed that panel. We'll get the whole 20-minutes uh, version for you, but the, uh, this is just the trailer that they allowed uh, on the internet um, about last night's show, in case anyone saw it or didn't see it. That last guy, if you didn't know, is Brent Musburger, longtime voice of uh, a lot of sports. I was on his radio show last week. He does a show out of a casino <laughs> in Vegas in a little uh, glassed off area. And I didn't know this, but he's always been quite the gambler, uh, which again brings up a lot of integrity issues in itself, broadcasting all these games as quite a gambler. But um, I bring this up again. I know we had the hour-long uh, presentation on it with the panel, but this is really gaining steam as it has we barrel towards December 4th and the Supreme Court. Um, I can't, I'm not a huge Chris Christie fan, but I can't argue with his premise. And I've been writing and talking about this. This is, a, this is hypocrisy. 
where you have sports leagues that are, again, what we talk about with Pete Rose, continue to hold up the cross sign against gambling because of the integrity of the game, because of public confidence. We have to have integrity. Yet, yet, two things. They're embracing, embracing fantasy sports, and they're putting teams in Las Vegas. So there is a hard argument to make about integrity right there. If they are protecting the integrity of the game by resisting gambling and fighting it in court tooth and nail all the way to the Supreme Court, December 4th, fighting gambling, yet putting teams in Vegas, just hockey's already started, football's coming, and embracing fantasy sports. Saying that fantasy sports aren't gambling. Okay, good luck with that. Of course they're gambling. So we have an issue uh, that's gonna hit ahead. And ag again, I think these shows on TV, these series, they're all about things that are resonating, you know, whether it's Kaepernick or now gambling, resonating beyond sports pages because Obviously, uh, whatever happens, I mean, let me say this first. You guys may know this better than I do. Supreme Court takes a case. That means something. So are they going to strike down PASPA? Maybe. Are they going to be something technical about PASPA? Maybe. But there's a chance, I talked to someone the other day in New Jersey that said, if they get a ruling from the Supreme Court on a, on a Monday, Monmouth Park is gonna have a sports book by Friday. By Friday. They are saying that to people. So if they get a ruling from the Supreme Court sometime, especially they're hoping during March Madness, they're going to be operating. They're ready to go. Now, will this open up the floodgates on sports gambling? Perhaps. Does Vegas want this? Absolutely not. They've got a monopoly. But you can't name me a state in this country that doesn't need extra money. Gambling's an easy way to get it. I said this in the group session we had next door. Everything we talk about with gambling, we're talking about it from a legality point of view, from a hypocrisy point of view. I'm not even talking about the morality point of view. Like I said, we had this conference here a couple years ago, some more at symposium. We had anti-gambling people outside the building. We had security. This is a hot topic, and we're not even talking about the morality police because it can lead to compulsive behavior. It can lead to addictive gambling. I had a student in here last year in this class, and he kind of admitted. He spends several hours a night on online gambling. <laughs> I said, well, how do, you, how do you study? He goes, yeah, that could be a problem. So again, that's for another, that's for a sociology class, I guess. What, what should we do about the morality of gambling? But the fact is, it's here in Vegas, it's here in Nevada. A lot of us do fantasy. Most of us do fantasy season long with friends and family, it's fun. But a lot of us do f daily fantasy, then it becomes a little more intense. Weekly fantasy with football, daily with basketball and baseball and hockey. And by the way, this kid, he's, he's still here. I've seen him. <laughs> he's like, no, I don't do football. That's, you know, that's every Tom, Dick, and Harry does football. I do, so you do NBA? No, I do hockey. Why hockey? No one knows hockey. You got to be really into it to do hockey because I, I win off all the people that don't know hockey. And that's the problem with fantasy sports because you get a lot of these algorithm people out there, these traders, and they clean up on the, on the first timers. 
the sharks and minnows thing. But that points back to what George said, George, our, our gaming, gaming consultant in the panel, you got to have regulation. And here's the thing about gambling. It is going to get worse, not better, without regulation. So I think the leagues really want to, lo to lose, these ca lose this case. Because if they lose this case, they can go create the framework of gambling with regulation. If they win the case, what are the stats? The stats are something like $5 billion of legalized gambling and $150 billion of illegal gambling goes on in this country. $150 billion illegal, five legal. So I think, you know, we talked about, do the NFL and NBA and Major League Baseball want to win this case or do they want to lose this case? Because we have Adam Silver writing an op-ed in favor of legalized gambling, but he's fighting the legislation in New, in New Jersey. We have Roger Goodell praising the regulation in Las Vegas where he's going to put a, the Raiders, but fighting the same regulation in New Jersey. And Chris Christie is right. It is absolute hypocrisy. It wouldn't be hypocrisy if it was just fantasy and it was just some casino interests in teams. But once they cross the Rubicon and put a team in Las Vegas, how can you defend that? And he's right. How do you get on moral high ground about integrity if you have a team in Vegas? That is something that one of those Supreme Court justices is going to ask the lawyer for the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball. He should. If he doesn't, I'll run up there and ask it. So I don't you guys are probably in exams. I'm going to try to go. Um, I guess you can walk in these Supreme Court hearings. But it's the same day they're doing the, the what is it, the cake case, the gay cake. Uh, and it's the same day they're doing some other case. So it's going to be quite a day at the Supreme Court, Monday, December 4th. OK, so I'll get you the, uh, the full segment on that. All right, so next week we'll finish up the uh, collective bargaining. We're going to talk about expiration of these agreements. What happens after that? And then I think we will talk about the concussion issues as well next week.